Welcome to the Roche Idea Lab. Please welcome Angie Howard and Angela Baldwin. Good morning, and welcome to the Roche Ideal Lab. The Ideal Lab is a community where we can come together to discuss the challenges we face as an industry. And it's a space where we can explore how to partner with each other, how to solve those challenges. Hi, my name is Angela Baldwin. And I'm Angie Howard, and we're your hosts for the Roche Ideal Lab. I'm the regional business manager with our molecular franchise supporting the Midwest region. I've got 20 years of, of experience in the healthcare industry, 12 of which have been here at Roche. And working in a variety of cross-functional teams. In my role, I have the opportunity of hearing directly from our healthcare executives and laboratorians regarding the challenges that impact them most. Thanks, Angie. And I'm a board-certified anatomical pathologist. I've been working as a pathology liaison, liaison in the Medical and Science Affairs Division of Roche since April. <laughs> as a member of the pathology, oncology, and molecular sequencing field team, I get to interact with key opinion leaders, customers, and investigators to share the value of our companion diagnostics and educate them on their proper utilization. I also work closely with other members of our internal Roche team. It's a very collaborative role where I have the opportunity to educate and learn from internal and external partners. Now, we're both really looking forward to hearing the ideas that our guests are bringing to the stage, as well as your thoughts and insights. One of the most pressing challenges we hear today are staffing shortages. Vacancy rates are soaring and all of us are struggling to find qualified individuals to fill these critical roles that we have. Today we'll be hearing how one lab is taking an innovative approach to recruitment. We'll also be hearing how labs can play a more active role in closing the health equity gap. I know this will generate very interesting conversation and we're looking forward to hearing all of your thoughts. And that is the goal of this lab to exchange ideas, hear new points of view, and at the end of the day, come away energized and ready to tackle what lies ahead. As always, we encourage your thoughts and comments, so be looking for both Angela's as we'll be coming around with microphones. So let's get started. So as we mentioned, staffing in an industry is an industry-wide challenge, and laboratories are exploring different approaches to meet that need. Tripore Reference Lab in Albuquerque is taking a two-pronged approach to solving their staffing sh shortages. They're partnering with local colleges and the Department of Labor to build apprenticeship programs. Here to tell us more about that are our very own Vivian Chan and Dr. Cecilia Thompson. Well, welcome. Well, I guess I'm a little loud. <laughs> <laughs> welcome and uh, staffing shortages, right? I mean, it's a hot topic. So let me just go over a few headlines that we have seen in publications that brought us to this hot topic. Kept today, a few months ago, characterized the current lab staffing shortage as going from a simmer to a rolling boil. And Dark Report in April had a headline, lab staffing shortages reaching dire levels. These are not new to us, right? We heard about this all the time, and this really has come to really a significant level during COVID. So, Welcome again, Dr. Thompson. We're so glad that you're here to share your um, learnings with us. Now, let me ask um, the audience here. Raise your hand if you have experienced staffing shortages. Very good. <laughs> I think everybody here have experienced that, right? So how is Tricor managing this crisis situation? Well, like many of you, we face staffing shortages. Um, and the pandemic has not helped that at all. Um, and in the short term, we did hire travelers, but that's really not gonna help the long-term situation. And so we've been doing many things to try to combat staffing shortages. We've been partnering with local universities and colleges who already offer MLS and MLT programs, providing the clinical space for those rotations. Um, New Mexico is also a unique state in that we don't require certification to work in the lab. So we get a lot of bachelor and associate degree graduates, which means we have to help support them um, and offer programs to introduce them to the clinical lab and give them that exposure they may not have already had. And of course, we're looking for operation solutions, um, increasing automation, digital microscopy, machine learning, to help uh, make our labs more efficient so that our techs can focus on the real issues. So how challenging, how challenging is it in recent years to continue this program? 
It's been really challenging. The programs that we would like and would hope to offer to help bolster our our employee workforce, they need time and people, and that's not always been available to us. So um, the pandemic, again, has not helped that. It's been very challenging, and I'm sure a lot of you can relate. Yeah, and, and I also know that you are doing something not only for your department, right? There are other programs that is going on at Tricor. Could you tell us a little bit about that? Sure, so Tricor, um, we've implemented a lot of apprenticeship programs. So we hire MLS and MLT students who have, clinic, who have finished their theoretical learning um, and are still working on completing their clinical uh, rotations. We hire them as apprentices so that we can help get them into the door a little bit sooner. Um, we also have specific apprenticeship programs for phlebotomy, cytology, and histology. And again, that's to get individuals with a scientific background in the door, um, help them get that specific training that they may not have, and then hopefully they join the workforce. And then I specifically work in infectious diseases, and we're working on microbiology apprenticeship programs through the ASM Weber State University program and through registered apprenticeship programs through the Department of Labor. Fantastic. Like Angie and Angela alluded to, right, that is a very special program with the Department of Labor and Weber State. So when did you start this program? How did you start it? And so we are still in the initial phases of starting these programs. As I alluded to, they take time, energy, um, and that's not always been available through the various surges. Um, so the planning stages started pre pretty recently this past spring, um, and uh, we're hoping to ramp them up as we now have people to um, oversee these programs. Fantastic. I know this is not simple. No program is ever simple, right? So you have to determine curriculum and you have to determine the stakeholders, who to recruit. So tell us a little bit more about uh, the recruitment process and what you do to attract new blood. Sure. So um, let me go let's take a step back and describe the apprenticeship program. So the um, ASM Weber State University program is a joint collaboration between the American Society for Microbiology and Weber State University. Um, this is geared toward individuals who have an undergraduate Bachelor of Science degree in an applied field. They can take courses at um, Weber State University and then labs can choose to participate in the program offering the clinical um, the clinical space for those individuals to finish their rotations with the goal of becoming certified as a microbiology tech um, by ASCP. And then the apprenticeship program through the Department of Labor is again in the early stages. These are registered apprenticeship programs that are funded through the Department of Labor geared towards STEM fields. They um, train individuals um, in a trade, they gain the knowledge, it's an on-the-job training program, um, again, hoping to get these individuals interested in STEM fields and then join the workforce as a career. So those are both options for undergraduate degrees, so we do a lot of outreach with um, our local colleges and universities, um, spending time at job fairs, um, going and talking to graduate students about what careers in lab medicine look like. So it's a lot of um, getting outside the lab um, and getting face time with those people. And then as for stakeholders, um, sorry, this is a loaded question. Um, it takes a, you know, um, a leadership um, involvement, institutional involvement with the Department of Labor. We work with New Mexico Department of Workforce Solutions. Um, the colleges and universities, getting curriculum ideas from those individuals. So there's a lot of seats at the table. Yeah, I know Dr. Cobreth and you and is coming from top down, very involved from Tricor to endorse it, knowing that we really do need to attract new blood, right? New young minds to our profession. So we're all very passionate about that. So talking about new young blood, uh, new generations, right? What do you think that um, it really attracts them to the lab when you try to recruit them? Um, I think it's a lot of different things for different individuals. For some people, it's you know wanting to help 
um, the patients, maybe not seeing themselves as a doctor or nurse or um, having that face-to-face -face contact, but still wanting to um, you know, serve a greater purpose, which I think a lot of people in the lab relate to. Um, there's also um, you know, being on the cutting edge of technology and having that, you know, a little bit engineering experience when you're working with instrumentation, um, programming, bioinformatics, there's a whole technical side as well. Um, so I think there's a lot the lab has to offer. It's just getting it out there um, to people who may not have um, had exposure previously. Fantastic. I know purpose is important, right? We always have to remind ourselves every day. And that's what attracted me to being a med medical technologist myself years ago. So how do you cope with the increased volume, the increased demand, especially during this time, with fewer people in the lab? Yeah, that's a great question. I think that um, if anyone out there has uh, other solutions, would love to hear it. So part of the Tricor um, experience has been adding more automation in our molecular microbiology lab, um, adding automation so that we can load um, primary containers onto the instrument. Those containers were, are bar barcoded and the test is read off of that barcode. barcode. It's associated with a patient. Um, the test um, you know, completes, the tech can review it and then release it and then troubleshoot if there are any issues along the way. In our microbiology, we're adding total lab automation. We're looking at digital microscopy. There are a lot of avenues that we're taking to try to um, offset the lack of text that we might have available. Okay. So when, when you're doing the training with the automation and you know, a lot of the different procedures, um, which one comes first when you train them? Um, I would say that the, the training programs that we have in, um, and that we're working toward, that's happening in concert with the automation that we're adding in the lab. We definitely want programs in place that elevate and support our already existing techs um, so that when they are in the lab, they feel comfortable and confident to do the work that they need to do. The automation we're adding um, is there to enhance their job. It's not there to replace it at all. Um, and what we find is that um, these younger generations that are more technologically inclined, <laughs> shall we say, um, that's something that does attract them. Fantastic. So we, we have come to the point to talk about automation, right? And um, we know that in this day in this day and age you know automation really does help cut down and be able to help you scale up and down um, i think this is uh, something that we all look forward to um, in, in terms of the programs you have now um, do you have something that the people in the audience can take away to model after your program i think every lab experience is going to be unique um, so there might be something that works for our lab that doesn't work for everyone. Everyone needs to look for solutions that'll work for their lab. And I think that there's no one right answer to um, the staffing challenges that we're all facing. Um, what we've done is try to create programs that, again, elevate and support the techs that we have in the lab and those folks that um, might be new to laboratory medicine. We've also tried to add more automation so that our techs who are highly intelligent, highly motivated, highly skilled, can spend more time on, on real issues, real problems, reviewing QC, troubleshooting um, a patient testing issue, um, instead of um, you know, accessioning samples, barcoding, things that an instrument can do. We want them with all of their skills, talent, and knowledge to be focusing on the real issues. Fantastic, and how do you motivate the young minds. <laughs> I don't, um, some of them you don't need to motivate. They come with motivation, ready and willing. They just want to learn. Um, so I don't think it, there's necessarily a huge lift on the lab's part. Um, there's a great uh, workforce out there. We just have to tap into it. Fantastic. And, and what about the people already working in the lab who have to take on this extra responsibility to train apprentices? 
Yeah, so um, at Tricor, we recently in the past six months hired a technical specialist that's specifically for training and education. Um, and before this, I can tell you that the lab was stressed with all of the extra learners that come in, the extra training that goes on. So having an individual that um, oversees these training programs and can help facilitate that um, has alleviated some of that pressure. And I know that we're a larger lab, so we can do something like that, but um, it does help to have a, 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 an individual who's overseeing this. Yeah, no, I agree, I agree. Um, so basically, we want to take this opportunity to really thank all the laboratories in the United States and the world during this really difficult COVID time, right? We're still wearing masks and we call them out as lab heroes. We truly appreciate everything you guys are doing for us and including your laboratory, Dr. Thompson. So we're gonna open up for uh, questions if anyone wants to ask a question, raise your hand. Angie and Angela would bring you the microphone. We have about enough time for one or two questions. Hi, um, good morning. Thanks for the talk. One question, how do you do that when when these students and the, the trainee, they, they stay at your lab and don't go to another lab? Yeah, so um, I think the question, if I understood, um, how do we get the trainees to stay in our lab and not go to another lab? Um, it's always a struggle. We have tried to create a um, culture that's inviting, um, an environment that's warm and welcoming, all of the extra things on top of the work to try to help make it an attractive place to stay. And I know that's hard when there's a lab down the road that pays a few more dollars an hour. That's always gonna be a competition for, for, the, for the workforce. But looking for the other things that you can get from the job, whether it's um, changing the schedule a little bit so that um, techs are working four times a week, 10 hours a day, instead of the traditional eight hours a day, five days a week. Um, extra programming that we do, um, bringing um, folks in for extra training for uh, key operators, having continuing education for techs, looking out for them in those other ways. Um, that's what we try to do to help um, give them an incentive to stay after all of that training and education that we've put in. We really appreciate that question because um, uh, just at dinner last night, uh, one of the lab directors in California actually shared with me that's the, that's the same challenge that he had to overcome, is that he would train people in the lab and then someone would pay a few dollars more and took them away. So he would share with me, I was hoping that he would be around <laughs> to share his example. So I'll just summarize what he told me is basically that he had to work really hard to keep up with the other laboratories and always constantly doing salary survey, right? We know that um, uh, it's important for us to kind of always monitor, right, that we're being competitive so that we're not losing the best talents. So um, yeah, I appreciate that question. That is very important nowadays. And we always know that our laboratorians are really not paid enough to do the hard work that we do. So appreciate that. Um, I think this is almost time. And um, do you have any parting words that you can share? <laughs> Um, I know that some of the apprenticeship programs I've described are, are somewhat ambitious, but I do think it's important to look for those extra sources of funding for these types of programs. It's not always easy to find that funding stream within our own institution, so looking for alternative sources, being creative uh, when it comes to thinking about some of the solutions for the staffing shortages, and then having spaces like, the, like this where we can share what each other, um, what the strategies others are working on, I think are very helpful. Fantastic. I know we have more to discuss on this topic, 
right? This is not going to go away. And so uh, we're going to probably try to take an approach and look at it from different angles and different programs to share with you, such as the one that Dr. Thompson has at Tricor. So thank you so much for your time today.